Good morning and welcome to Cosmic Conversations here on the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page. My name is Ryan Wyatt. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our weekly program where we talk to experts in different parts of the astronomical wonderland. And today we'll be talking to Dr. Jackie Faraday from the American Museum of Natural History, all about brown dwarfs and rogue planets. And uh, we'll be mostly looking at uh, imagery from the digital universe. So welcome, Jackie. Hi, hi, Ryan. And hi, everybody that's watching. I'm very excited to present to you guys today with Ryan. Ryan is one of my best friends and one of these amazing science visualizers. So I think we can take you on a really fun tour. Sounds great. So we're actually going to start close to home, uh, kind of in orbit around Earth. And I think we'll start by pulling out and then looking at some constellations. And I'll just mention that uh, at, very, at various points, you'll see my cursor on the screen. It's just because I'm piloting live through our digital universe. So uh, to do that, I sometimes need to kind of show the, the cursor. Well, let me go ahead and put up the constellation lines. Uh, and then I think you wanted to introduce some of the uh, collections of stars that help us identify where brown dwarfs are in the universe mm -hmm. around us. Yeah, so um, from, I, I think we probably have a lot of veterans in here that are used to seeing these great tours. And what you're seeing is, so we're on the Earth and we've got the constellations on on that are really pointing out the brightest stars in the sky. And so we're kind of coming around. It looks like that's probably Pegasus right in front of us. We don't have a pointer unless you can point out. Ryan, oh, there you go. Um, Cassiopeia is kind of up and to the left. These are constellations that you probably, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, these are very bright. Even in New York City, we can see um, the, the center of Pegasus and the W or the Epsilon or the E or the M because we're rotating around of Cassiopeia. But these are the brightest stars. These are stars that are, um, you can walk outside and even from uh, the, the crowded streets of New York on an evening, you would be able to see these stars. The objects that I'm an expert in and uh, that we're going to turn on next are objects that are um, that you cannot see with your eye. And actually, Ryan, I think one, well, actually, he's brought them up. Yep. So, so aside from the idea that you've got all these stars that you can see with your eye, uh, there is there is an array of objects out there that you cannot see. You need either instrumentation to help you, meaning um, you need it, you need a telescope and you need to look in a different wavelength. So the objects that Ryan just turned on, um, and I think Ryan, this is probably all of them, right? Like all of the round dwarfs? I think so. I think it's all that are in our collection, yeah. Okay. About a, about a thousand, I think. Yeah, so this would be the uh, just over a thousand that we have gathered a lot of data on. There are way more than a thousand in the galaxy. But these are a subsample of these very close by ones. And we've color coded them purple. Are they all purple, Ryan? They are all purple. I wasn't able to differentiate between the different types. That's okay. That's still good. So they're they're purple if, because they're so cold. They're a lot more like Jupiter than they are like the sun. And their atmospheres are dominated by um, not necessarily the things that you get in our sun, which is very, very hot towards the, um, towards the part that you look at. Like if you're looking at a sunset or a sunrise when it's safe to look at the sun, uh, you're looking at um, kind of a surface that's about 5,000 degrees or so. These so that's objects, why you look in infrared light. So it, wavelengths are a little longer and less energetic. Yeah, exactly. So these objects are so much colder that their light we can't see with our eyes for sure. And so we turn to infrared light, which is longer wavelength, and then we're able to see them. These objects don't have enough mass to get nuclear burning going like we get in the core of stars. And so they just cool throughout their lives. And there you can see as we're kind of moving around, maybe constellations that you're used to, uh, you're seeing that these objects are distributed across the sky. Uh, and the ones that Ryan has up right now, these are regular objects. They're just kind of run of the mill. We're not, uh, we, we don't know exactly how old they are, but they're probably somewhere in mass between about 75 times the mass of Jupiter, all the way down to the lower mass end, which is probably around 13 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, but we have a special subset, right, Ryan, that we can bring up? 
Uh, which ones were you looking for? We're going to bring up the young ones. So let's now see. I, don't, I don't think I have those separated out, unfortunately. Well, you've got the oh, so you've got the moving group. Oh, in yes, here. I do have those, though. So I can yeah, hide those. those. OK, so now Ryan has brought up markers on objects that are special amongst this collection. And that is because when I was looking at brown dwarfs as during my PhD, um, this subsample was fairly known. And look, we've got, uh, you can point out um, the Southern Cross, Ryan, which we're just kind of passing by. So we're in a southerly part of the sky. And this, for those of you that didn't know, a lot of young stars are in the south. And so these objects that are highlighted here are ones that we looked at, and it turned out that uh, there was something weird about them. And uh, they, they had some spectral features. Have you guys talked about spectra at all, Ryan? Uh, we, uh, we have in different programs, but it's probably worth just a little bit of an aside about spectra. Okay, so if you take the light of an object and you pass it through a prism and you look at what it's, you can, you can see the fingerprints of what it's composed of. So you can see like how much any of a gas is in it, how much um, sodium, how much potassium, how much calcium. These objects, they've got a lot of oxides. So iron oxide, they've got vanadium oxide, they've got titanium oxide, a lot of interesting chemistry that happens when you're um, colder. Um, they have methane. And when we looked at these objects that have the um, uh, jacks, would you call them jacks around it, Ryan? We, we nickname them jacks, yes. <laughs> okay, the objects that have the jacks around them turned out to be younger. Uh, and they were associated with other stars that are in their vicinity that happen to be uh, co-moving together. We call them moving groups or young stellar associations. We got their ages. And once you know the ages of these kinds of objects, you realize that they're very, very low mass. So the purple ones that you see and brought up first, and brown dwarfs, objects that just don't have sustained hydrogen burning, that are uh, highlighted by the jacks, are really unusual. These are objects that are young and that they're really low mass. So they're the ones that kind of back down the boundary at 13 times the mass of Jupiter or so. And at 13 times the mass of Jupiter, you really start scratching your head about them because um, that gets into planetary mass where you would right. think this would have had to form in a solar system. So these objects are particularly exciting because they, they rival the definition, uh, how should I say this, the problem to a definition on the high mass end that Pluto does on the low mass end. The way we fight about is Pluto a planet? We fight about these objects that have the jacks around them and what do we call them because they don't have a host star. They're just off on their own. But they're only a couple Jupiter masses. So it's kind of interesting. There's this sort of kind of question of definitions. I guess nature doesn't really uh stick to definitions the way people like to but between brown dwarfs and stars on the one end on the more massive and then brown dwarfs and planets on the lower mass side yeah i think this is one of to me the most important questions that can get addressed in astronomy right now is what is it that is the the physical mechanism that is behind these objects because the word planet actually doesn't mean all that much it, it definitely invokes people's like, I don't know, emotions. They get very excited about the word, but it doesn't tell you wh how the object formed. It doesn't tell you about the properties of the object itself. So you're left with a lot of questions, even if you call something a planet. And um, these objects are extremophiles in that they really challenge that definition. And we can fly to one of them, Ryan. So why don't we fly towards J1119? Okay, should I go ahead and take some of these other markers down or maybe the constellations or leave Yeah, you out? can take some of them down. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so let's make our way toward J1119. And uh, people might be asking, why would you name something that and not some fun name? Um, and that is both the fortunate and unfortunate aspect of astronomy. Uh, we don't get to name things after our favorite, I don't know, food or 
place in the world. Uh, instead, you're really you're named by your location, and the coordinates of this particular object that we're flying to is at hours 19 minutes, and I don't really remember the rest of the coordinates, but I can find it on my machine. Um, I had a question in a program yesterday about who gets to name things uh, in astronomy, and it's kind of a, it's almost a painful topic. It, it is a painful topic, yeah, I think. And I think you have a lot of opinions about this naming. And um, I, I tend to forget how annoying it is because I just go with the numbers and then I start to feel like the numbers sound really cool. Like 1119, I get excited when I hear that number ever because it reminds me of this object. So, um, oh, oh, we have a good question here. You mentioned some of these are young. How do you determine the approximate age of some of these objects? That is an excellent question. And you might actually ask too, I'll just back off of that for one second and say, I didn't say how young they were. I said they were young. And to give context, our sun is roughly four and a half billion years old. And um, so that's, that's, that's when we say older. It's not even that old, right? Like that's middle age. Mm -hmm. um, the age of the universe is roughly 13 billion years. So the sun's, you know, making its way four and a half billion. These objects, and this one in particular, is in an association called the TW Hydra Association. And um, the age of that is roughly between five and 20 million years old. So mm, sound a million old. with an M. Right, million with an M. And I, I know that those of us that are in our um, later years, that, that feels very old. But um, when we say young, we don't mean like 10 years old or 100 years old. We mean millions of years old. So this object here that we're moving around, I love this object so much. This object was discovered in part in a catalog by a woman named Kendra Kellogg, who was a grad student at um, first Stony Brook University, and then she went to Western Art Ontario because her advisor moved there. And um, the story here is that Kendra was writing a paper that had this object in it. I happened to be the referee on that paper and noticed that it was a strange object. And I alerted her to that and declared myself uh, as that I was refereeing the paper. And she was able to make note that this object was potentially young. Her and I, as well as an astronomer from the University of Montreal named Jonathan Gagne, then all got together and decided to write a paper on it because we looked at it very carefully and found that indeed the way that it was moving was um, it was moving with these other young stars in TW Hydra. And we were able to say, yeah, this thing is only a couple million years old. And at that temperature, that means that this object is just in the 10 Jupiter range. Wow. Yeah. And, and so that helps you actually figure out both its distance and its age, right? That's right. Yeah. So when you know how, uh, when you can get an idea of the temperature of an object, which we basically use the spectra that I was referring to as a proxy for it, you're able to say um, how far away it probably is to be that temperature because you can't mm -hmm. see a, a say a 1500 degree object you can't see that at 3000 light years it doesn't give off enough light so you know that it has to be within a range and then you can watch it over several years and you can see its motion through the galaxy and you take those two things your estimate of how far away it is and its motion and you can pinpoint that with other objects around it and in doing that, you're able to say um, it's likely in one of these associations. So that's how we were able to get it. And um, I don't think I fully answered the question of how do we do the age dating. So you do not use this object to figure out how old it is. You would use stars that are more like our sun. And then you can compare stars that are more like our sun. And we know that certain aspects of stars that are like our sun look a certain way when they're younger and um and that comes in how bright they are because when stars age they have to contract their radius doesn't contract to its final uh, radius for quite some time 
and there's a mass relation to that. But because of that, you'll see them much brighter when they're younger. And so, and also the younger stars are very, they give off a lot of x-rays, they give a lot, a lot of what's called chromatic activity. And mm -hmm. that you locate that, you compare to them, and you can say thing a million years old compared to the sun. And you can find all the other stars co-moving with it. And it's kind of like a bootstrap method. I guess it's also probably worth noting that what we're flying around is sort of an artist's representation of this kind of object, but it's informed by what we kind of think these objects look like. They're not sort of uniform in brightness like stars, but they actually have clouds and sort of atmospheres that are, that are a little bit more like planets in many ways. Yeah, that's very important that we should make sure people know that we did not take this image. We saw just the dot of light from this thing. This is most definitely an artist rendition. Do you know who's did um did Robert Hurt create this? I actually am not sure. Uh, we may have borrowed it from Robert Hurt, who actually was the our guest last week on our Cosmic Conversation, uh, or it might be something we we made here in house. So I don't. I actually don't recall. Well, important on this is exactly what you were just noting that this thing it 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 should invoke people's because. Um, they're very much like Jupiter. We think they have bands of clouds that run along the hemisphere. We think that they have crazy storms that are raging, similar to the great red spot on Jupiter. Uh, and so this artist rendition is trying to show you between the dark areas and the light areas, the dynamic atmospheric uh, conditions that are probably occurring, where the dark areas are probably cloud cover that is very mm. thick and not letting you see. Uh, and then the lighter areas is where you've got holes in the clouds or a lighter cloud layer that's allowing flux or heat from deeper down to escape out. And this is actually what we see on Jupiter as well. So it's a very cool object. Actually, yeah, there was that really amazing image uh, by Gemini uh, of uh, Jupiter that was released about a week ago that kind of showed this sort of pattern. Maybe we'll drop that in the in the uh, comment section later. Yeah, that's a good comparison because that image of Jupiter was out Standing. Yeah, it was really stunning. Um, cool. Well, do you want to visit any other objects while we're, while we're out Yeah. Here? Well, so we were just saying, I just said the word cool. So why don't we go to the coldest of all brown dwarfs, which is an object that also doesn't have the greatest name, even though I love the name. It's called Wise 0855. And part of why this one is so quote unquote cool, because it is cold is because it is, you can see we're flying back in an area that makes the constellations come together a little bit more. This takes you to uh, just outside, spitting distance away from the sun. This is in total, the fourth closest object to the sun. So um, when we think about the, 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 the nighttime sky, and when you're looking up, you're seeing stars, but you have no idea how far away the stars are, right? Like the brightest one to you, Betelgeuse for instance, um, might seem like it's gotta be one of the closest stars because it's so bright. But in fact, it's totally off because it's such a massive star that's so hot that um, it, there it is off thousands of light years from you. And, um, and it shines brightly in your nighttime sky, this object, this object, 0855, this object is just about 100 degrees, Kel uh, 100 degrees I'm going to say Kelvin, but uh, most people will think of it in a different scale, but think of it as 100 degrees warmer than Jupiter. And in order to find that kind of object, it has to be really close to you. So right. you don't see these far away. You can't see these things far away. And actually, we weren't even sure this thing was gonna exist, but the entire NASA Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Telescope, WISE, uh, which was launched and ran from about 2000 and it was the, the, the early, I'm sorry, the late aughts, so like late 2000 decade, into like still taking some data, um, had been imaging the sky in mid infrared so a little bit longer than say what you radiate, your body radiates out in when you mm -hmm. give off your heat. 
And um, that mission was almost entirely trying to find objects. Uh, one of the main missions was to find objects like this that we think might litter the entire galaxy. Um, is this thing is so awesome? It's so. This is another artist rendition, and um, again, you're seeing that same banded cloud structure. But unlike J1119, which we were just at, this object is more than a thousand degrees cooler. So probably this is about 250 degrees Kelvin, and 1119 is probably about 1400, maybe 1500 degrees Kelvin. And 250, that's like, that's kind of like room temperature ish, right? Yeah, yeah, that's like the North Pole. That's okay. like. So a cold room. <laughs> cold, room. Cold, cold room at the North Pole. <laughs> or just about that. Uh, and, and so, and the other thing about this one, so I mentioned how low mass that 1119 was. This object as well is um, is really breaking down the boundary on the definition of planet because here it is. It's not young. It's it's definite. It's not part of any group that we know of, like that other one was. It just hangs out completely by itself, and it is even if we say it's as old as the the age of the universe, mm -hmm. it's not more than ten Jupiter masses. So. This thing is a really low mass object. It's, it's like Jupiter is out there all by itself. And so it should make you wonder, and I know we're orbiting an artist's rendition, but I really wonder about the solar system around this thing. I really wonder about what's around it. Like, does it have moons? Does it have planets? There's so many questions about this object. And in the coming years, the James Webb Space Telescope is getting launched. Mm -hmm. And this primary target, this is the target that they're gonna go after an instrument because you can learn so much about solar system from looking at this thing. Awesome. Yeah, this object's gonna, this is a real winner of an object. And so the, uh, I think I used the, the term rogue planet earlier and this, this would qualify? Yes, this is definitely upon that qualification. And so to give that definition, or definition, to give that word a little bit more context is that we, we don't know what the highest mass planet is that you can create. We also don't really know what the lowest mass object you can create through the star formation process. But we do know that it becomes, the, that the stars become less efficient at forming as you get to lower and lower and lower masses, and that planets are harder to make at these giant masses. So it's a real quandary of how often you would even get an object like this. And um, we typically use 13 Jupiter masses as this, like that's kind of a good boundary because you don't have good interior physics to get deuterium burning, but that's mm -hmm. really an interior physics definition. So. Hmm. Um, it doesn't really tell you much about the formation process. But that's sort of the reality of the, the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're almost up on time. We might have time to visit one other spot if you want to. Otherwise, we could head home and try to take some questions. Uh, I think, why don't we, we could go to, you've already talked about Trappist. I was thinking that we could. We did talk about Trappist last week. Yeah. We talked about Trappist last week. But my thought was that, um, because we were just showing 1119, which is young and definitely mm -hmm. has a solar system, or sorry, and definitely within its own moving group. 0855 all by itself, and we have mm -hmm. no idea what's around it. Trappist, the object that you guys talked about last week, that thing is barely a star. Like, it's one of these objects that knocks on the door of the definition of a brown dwarf and a star at the high mass end. So this object doesn't have enough mass to get um or has just enough mass to get hydrogen burning going the way that our sun does mm -hmm. and let's just show what the orbit of things around that thing looks like yeah let's show the face on yeah so there's one i'm going to make correct one little mistake that we have here which is that uh our star disappeared and that's uh, not because there's no star at the center of the system it's because um uh, I needed to uh, reset something in the software, um, but I will do that right now so that we can actually see our star. <laughs> yeah.
So, um, but as as you put it on, we're also seeing like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven orbits around it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Nice. And it's orange because it's so faint. This is also so faint. You cannot see Trappist with your eye. Um, it's so, it's bare, barely a star. This is the thing I want people to walk away from when they think about Trappist, that if that object has this many planets around it, that's seven worlds. And those are only the ones that we know about. All the brown dwarfs that we were looking at, they must be teeming with planets too. Like we have so much to learn about the systems, about these systems. Cause so these are all really tight too. We can't show Mercury's orbit here, right? But all of these are well within Mercury's orbit. Right. Around, They're super tight around their star because that object, again, barely a star, it's not going to have much material around it to offer up to planets and for them to form. Yet, this, this is your signature. This is a signature that it happens. And so the lower mass your star is, the lower mass your planets probably are. Mm -hmm. These are all rocky worlds um, that people like to compare to Earth, Venus, so small, small worlds. And um, all those brown dwarfs we just showed you, they may just very well have rocky worlds hanging out around them, too. So that sure. should give people a little, bit of, a little bit of fun fantasy for what they could think about. <laughs> very cool. Well, just uh, because you were talking about the rocky worlds, I did start to fly up. Uh, oh, close there to one of these, we go. It happens to be... Uh, Kind of at the right distance to perhaps be the one of the more earth-like candidates right size right distance from its from its star it's still much much closer to uh, the parent star than, than earth is to the sun yeah rocky this is again an artist rendition and a rocky world that's orbiting this barely a star so when i see these and i love these artist renditions of these these potential worlds it just every time i look at one of my objects now i think what is around you <laughs> very cool and uh and actually someone asked because i talked about this uh last night at, during a presentation how old is the trappist one system ah great question my student eileen wrote a paper recently about this very question because trappist has some oddities to it it looks like it it there were some hints that it had some things in its spectra that were reminiscent of what we saw with 1119 that made it made us think it might be young. But mm -hmm. now we, we remain kind of unclear about what that is, if it's just that the radius is a little bit inflated. So the, the, the age that we basically get for Trappist is something like 6 billion years. It's like, oh, wow, okay. It's, it's kind of, it's kinematic. It's basically how it moves is one of the stronger indications that it's just not, it's, it's, it's a run of the mill kind of like disc star in the galaxy. So this is not a young system at all. This is really more. Uh, That's right. Really a well-established uh, planetary system. Yeah. And there was a question of like, to get those kinds of planets around it, would you need it to be young? Like, will they stay stable? So that that's, it's a very, very, very intriguing analysis to look at a system like that, super tight, seven rocky worlds around an object that is, um, so these objects, and that one is what's called an M8. It's a, um, it's like a late type. It's a late type star in the mm -hmm. M classification. It's got very little mass to offer up and it contracts. It takes like a billion and a half years to even reach its kind of like happy medium. Wow. And throughout that whole process, it's got a very different amount of flux that would be reaching those planets. Very cool. So it's got a it's got a very very rapidly moving well rapidly it's got a very a, a, a strongly moving habitable zone around it. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. What uh, where the planets are in their habitable zone now might not be uh, where they were in the past. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Well, unfortunately, we're kind of at time, but I really wanted to thank you for spending some time with us this morning, Jackie. Uh, maybe if we, in case we do have a couple of questions from online, uh, that would be awesome. Otherwise, um, oh, we do have a question. Hey. Would a thing orbiting a brown dwarf be a planet or a star? I, right now, that is a hotly debated, um, uh, like almost like a linguistics question. There are some objects 
and I can point you to this object called Two Mask 1207. And it is basically a brown dwarf with a very, very low mass um, companion, a three Jupiter mass around like a 35 Jupiter mass system. And um, some people call that a planet. Some people call that a planetary mass companion or a P, excuse me, a PMC. <laughs> Some people prefer to call it just a binary brown dwarf. So it really depends on who you're talking to. I often call it a planet, um, but I also don't put a lot of weight into the word planet when I use it in that way. Well, there was a professional conference uh, so, several years ago now. I think that you, I think they had a, a little quiz that people could take beforehand. Like, would you, here's yeah. an object. Would you classify it as a star or planet? And there was very strong disagreement. Right, oh, yeah. Specialists. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I've been at many conferences where we've done that. And I've done that, that poll amongst my colleagues. And you can get people in extremely heated debates about this because they get super like, they get very protective of if you've called it a planet or if you've called it a brown dwarf. And this is what I mean, like, it's frustrating because to me, the word planet just invokes irrational behavior in people and scientists. My preference is that we just call everything a world. It's a world. And then, like, there's no debate. Like, the word right. world doesn't invoke the solar system in some way where you think, well, I mean, if it's going to be a planet, it's got to be... Jupiter Earth or, you know, like the world. All right. Well, with that closing thought, again, thanks so much for joining. And uh, we'll be putting uh, questions in the chat, too, so we can come back and answer anything. And we'll add some links down there as well. So thanks, Jackie. And uh, look forward to talking again soon. Yay. All right. Thanks, everybody.